And joining us now, Joe Martin, the author of Relentless Change, a casebook for the study of Canadian business history. Good of you to join us again here at TVO. Thank you, Steve. I want to start by reading an excerpt from the book. One hundred years ago, both Australia and the United Kingdom were much richer than Canada. Canada surpassed the United Kingdom in the mid-1940s and Australia in the early 1950s. It even made progress in relation to the United States over those 100 years. However, given the relentless nature of change in capitalist economies, there is never room for complacency. A more finely granulated analysis shows that Canada's more recent economic performance has not been keeping pace, either with other countries or with our own record, since the recession of the early 1980s. This book attempts to give clues as to the reason for Canada's economic success for most of the past century and for the more recent slowdown. Let's pick up on that last thought. Do you think Canadian business today has become more complacent? Well, the one thing I would add is if, if we did the same number for 2010, I think we might be showing a little better because of the strength of our financial system. I don't think they become complacent. I think uh, where I changed my mind in, from beginning to the, uh, writing the book to the end was I, I think generally speaking we've had reasonable public policy. We've certainly had all the proof that we've got one of the best financial systems going. Mm -hmm. I, I learned so much about the entrepreneurs in this country. I, I didn't think we had a lot. We've had many, and they keep on coming. And you never know where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. The weakness appears to me in the management of the large corporations, partially because many of them are foreign-owned. So you have big oil, big auto. People here are subs. What we have to, I hope we're going to have in the future, are Canadian-based large corporations operating globally and that's when we'll get the sophisticated management, which I think will drive our economic growth. A lot of themes there. Let's unpack them all as we go along. The diamond of sustainable growth. This is right. one of the theories that you enunciate in the book. Right. Tell us what you mean by that. Well, first of all, it's not mine. I got it from the Stern School in New York City. And their theory is that for economies to grow, national economies, you have to have four interacting parts. Sound public policy a sound financial system. By the way, they, they refer to the public policy as non-predatory governments. One of my students said, give me an example of a predatory government, and I said Zimbabwe, and he said something not that extreme. <laughs> but we, the government policy, the financial system, which has really been tested in Canada in the past two years, have come out well. Then the, the dynamic entrepreneurs, I guess the greatest one of, of recent times being um, Magna, Frank Stronach. That would be an example. In the early days, Roy Thompson. The, before that, Max Ake and Lord Beaverbrook. How about RIM today? They're the well, best example today, yes. aren't they? Yes, and, but they're an example of going forward. They're not only an example of superb entrepreneurs, and they're not the only ones in the Waterloo area, mm -hmm. but they seem to have created a, a corporation with sophisticated management that compete globally. And I guess while we're talking about that area, open text would seem to be following in their steps. So we, we got three for four on that scale anyway, don't yes. we? Yes, oh yeah, very much so. Yeah, okay, so let's go through these. And I want to take you back now through some of the history right. which you teach uh, at the Rotman School as well. Uh, the Coyne Affair. Right. Everybody knows Andrew Coyne. Right. This is his dad, who people may right. not remember, was the head of the Bank of Canada. Right, second governor of the bank. Second governor. Remind us of what happened. We're going back how many years now? 40, 50 years when, when this happened? He was appointed in, uh, late, in the mid-50s right. by the uh, Louis Saint Laurent government. And, of course, there was controversy at the time of his appointment because many people felt Louis Rasminski should have received the appointment. Which he eventually did. Which he eventually did. What happened was is that uh, whereas the governor of the Bank of Canada normally would give one, maybe two speeches a year, Mr. Coyne had very strong views on what should be happening. And he took a much more political stance, gave speeches all over the country, and he was in conflict with the Minister of Finance and more particularly the Prime Minister. And so we had a full-blown crisis between monetary and fiscal policy. And you can imagine if what we've just been through, if we had that same thing now. They got to be singing out of the same hymn book, don't that's they? That's right, although what's happening, and there was a very good piece in one of our local papers this week showing that around the world there's a lot of challenge going on to the authority of the central banks. So here it got so bad, a group of economists did something, back in the 50s I'm talking about, did something never been done before. They wrote the government of the uh, Prime Minister of Canada and said he should be fired. 
and eventually he was, but as Desmond Morton noted in one of his books, John Diefenbaker did the impossible. He made Mr. Coyne look good. <laughs> By firing him? Well, b b the way he did it. The way he did it. The way he did it. And, and Coyne had a liberal Senate uh, that he testified before, and he came out looking like a hero and a martyr, when in fact I think he deserved to be fired. Gotcha. Okay, that's uh, an example from public policy. Let's do a case study here on entrepreneurship. Uh, we remember, I guess about 20, 25 years ago, as we were going through uh, signing of free trade agreements right. and that kind of thing, pretty much everybody in the country anticipated that if we went into a free trade agreement with the United States, our wine industry would go right into the toilet. It exactly. would be sacrificed. Exactly. We now know, of course, that hasn't happened. They're right. Better than ever. Right. How come? Well, and by the way, I was very active in that. I was head of my trade association. We fought hard for free trade, but we all gave up on wine. I think the... Uh, uh, there was sound public policy, but I think the person who deserves the most credit for it is Donald Zeraldo and his, and his uh, winemaker. This winemaker was of Austrian origin, as many of the best winemakers are, who almost felt it was a duty to drink local wines, and he tried. But the grapes we grew were so awful that you couldn't drink. Couldn't make a good bottle. Uh, yeah. And so they gradually got the government to reg uh, allow uh, hybrids. And we started to get better wines, and Zeraldo went out and marketed the notion of the v VQA, so that you got a standard. And then the government stepped in, the government of David Peterson, and facilitated the transition for the winemakers from one system to another over the period of free trade. So I think it was an excellent example of a combination of sound public policy, entrepreneurs, and, and eventually a large corporation in in uh, Vincor. And I guess inventing new product, as in ice wine, well, wasn't a bad thing either. That's right. That really got popular. And I've heard Donald's got a new, he's back in business with a new Donald Zeraldo ice wine, I've heard. He's I haven't one seen of the it. Best. Yeah. He is. Uh, okay, entrepreneurship, you said, was a part of that. My hunch is when Canadians think about how entrepreneurial we are, we don't score all that well. It's not the first adjective that's, that that's comes to mind. That's the perception. Yeah. Is that true? I don't think it's true at all. And in fact, I think the numbers show that we have a higher percentage of entrepreneurs than the United States. As a percentage of the population? Yeah, as a percentage That's of totally the population. totally against conventional wisdom. I know it is. Okay, so tell us what we don't know about the, 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 our history of entrepreneurship in this country. Well, I know, you know, wherever you begin, the, uh, you can talk about uh, Radisson and Grossier, uh, who were there in New France, and they couldn't stand the constraints imposed upon them by the government of New France. So what did they do? They went across the English, and they led to the establishment of or the oldest corporation in North America, the Hudson's Bay Company. Uh, if you talk about Mackenzie and Mann, whose names are not well known now, but created the third railway, National Transcontinental Railway, Mac both of these guys were in Toronto. Mackenzie owned Benvenuto, where there is now an apartment building. Mm -hmm. But they not, only, they not only created railways, but they had businesses in South America all over the world. And so what struck me as I read through was on example after example after example of Canadians who had cr uh, created great companies. So why do we have this reputation of being very poor risk takers and very timid uh, business people on the international stage? Well, I, I, I haven't got an answer to that one. I, I just, in, I've come to the conclusion that it's wrong and uh, I haven't quite figured out why the image exists that way. And the, other, the same thing, by the way, one of the things, one of the criticisms of our banking system is that they don't provide financing for the entrepreneurs. And uh, a good mutual friend of yours and mine says the Cana Canadian banks are identical in everything they do. Well, I've just read a book of a printing entrepreneur in Winnipeg. He's third generation, and the company's now fourth generation. It was called Salts and Pollard. And it's now Pollard Banknote. And this corporation is the second largest corporation in the world printing lottery tickets. <laughs> And when the third generation really started to go expand, their bank, the Bank of Commerce, basically fired them. And you would have thought that was over. He went across the street to the TD, got all the financing he need, and they're with TD to this day, and they're now operating in Canada, the United States, and Europe. So historically speaking, that knock on the banks, you would say, is false? That's my, that's the conclusion I'm coming to. Who is the most dynamic entrepreneur in Canadian history? Well, I think you'd have to go with Donald Smith, even though I'm not particularly fond of it. That's 100 years ago or more, isn't it? 
Yeah, well, okay, Sam Bronfman more recently. Okay. What a hell of a story that is. Mm -hmm. You've already mentioned Lazarus and Bezali. Uh, I've talked about Stronach. You like Frank Stronach, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think there's all kinds of them. Lord the of Oh, well, yeah. yeah. Max Aitken. Yeah. Yeah. So we've had a few. And so, more, than, more than we think is, is well, your point. Well, and, and Garfield Weston, during the Great Depression, Garfield Weston was acquiring a company a week. Hmm. Confederation Life. Roy Thompson. Roy, don't forget Roy Thompson. Yeah. He got a hall named after him. Uh, Confederation Life. Uh, your book suggests the importance of effective management in the overall economy, and that's the case study you give. What happened at Confed Life? Well, what happened, and I think what happened in Confederation Life, and when the author and I uh, discussed this, Rod McQueen, was not, we discussed that in early 2008. And up until that time, that was the largest financial institution. Well, fa failure in the world and you know and by the end of 2008 it looked like small potatoes and the students wonder why we why we did it but what happened was you had the failure of management of the board of directors and I think of the regulators and so that and what I'm just about finished uh, too big to fail and it what's clearly what's happened in most of those situations whether you're talking AIG you're talking Bear Stearns or Lehman Brothers etc a group of the players get in a room and they work out a deal. That almost happened there, but uh, Great West Life paid silly bugger, and so it, it did not happen, although the good news is that no policyholder suffered. Are Canadians known internationally as competent managers? Well, in the life insurance industry they are. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we're starting to be known that way in uh, the banking community, but only just briefly. Which we've got a much larger, longer history in uh, life insurance. Hmm. Okay, so as you go back to that Stern School diamond of sustainable right. growth, how do you think we fare? Well, I think we fare well, and I think, given what has occurred in the past, what, 30 months or more, that that financial system stability is going to pro uh, provide us with great opportunities and that we're going to do even better. So I'm I am not pessimistic. I put out the numbers saying we've got a challenge, but I think we can meet the challenge, especially if we put more emphasis on education in terms of business uh, at a lower level. Okay, we're going to London this right. weekend. Agenda's going on the road. We're going to London, Ontario, and a lot of what we're going to be talking, obviously, about is, is rebranding Ontario, recreating Ontario, looking to the future of Ontario economically. Uh, talk to us about London for a little bit here. Uh, compared uh, compared to other cities of a comparable size, how's it doing? Well, I think London is not, if you want to use the way you began the interview, London is not the London it was. Hmm. London, when I moved to Toronto in 1968, was reputed to have more millionaires per capita than any other city of its size. It had three great national corporations, London Life, Canada Trust, Labatt's, and we shouldn't forget that historically that's where Imperial Oil was started before it was sold in Rockefeller and mm -hmm. Standard Oil. And as, in preparing for the show, I read the Canada Trust book, which was written 20 years ago. And the overwhelming impression I had is the problem with those three great corporations was Canada itself. That's, they only looked at Canada. I mean, here is Canada Trust one to British Columbia, long distance. Mm -hmm. And then I asked somebody about London Life, and London Life was the only life and major life insurance company that didn't sell policies in the United States. So I think the issue for London in the next generation of leadership is to look beyond Canada, as the, as the corporations like OpenText have done in Waterloo. So that, and what I've learned in preparing for this is that London now has a much more diverse ethnic mix and I think that's where you're going to get many of the best entrepreneurs of the future. So do we have to stop thinking of Canada as the market and more of North America as the market? Yes. Kenichi Omai, 25 years ago, wrote a book called Triad Power. And he said you have to be strong in your home market. For Canadians, the home market has to be all of North America because you need 300 million population base, especially given the problems of interprovincial inter barriers of trade. I mean, we can talk about problems of free trade with the U.S., mm -hmm. We've got, you know, John Bragg 
uh, has to get a permit to move his bees from between New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, whereas in the United States you can take your bees from Maine, you know, from Florida to Maine. Have we come some distance in that, though? I think I remember the days where if you wanted to sell beer in this, or if you wanted to make beer in this country, you had to have a brewery. You had to have a brewery in every province that you could sell, yeah. that you wanted yeah. to sell in. We've, it's we've, not that bad anymore. Well, it's, it's not, it's not, yes, it's, it's better, but it's not as good as it should be. But the main message is you've got to start looking at a market from the Rio Grande North, and once you've got that uh, basis established, because, I've, because the United States is not going to be the power 20 years or 30 years from now that is today, but you've got to have that bigger base that you can move offshore, either to Europe or to Asia. So if you were in London and you wanted to be making recommendations as to how that city could be more economically competitive and powerful, what would you tell them? Well, the thing I would, I would encourage them is that, make, do you have a good junior achievement organization in your community so that you can start at the grassroots building entrepreneurs? Uh, I would say, the business school, are you teaching them at the business school? And I don't know this. I used to have a very close association with the business school, wrote articles for their business quarterly annually. But are you, are you getting out there, not only teaching in the classroom, but in, in, interacting with the community and talking about the importance of going beyond Canada? Hmm. I mean, you're not that far from Michigan. As you remember, when the Blue right. Jays started up, the problem with the London fan was, are you going to support the Tigers or the Blue Jays? That's it. Yes, sir. Uh, the junior achievement angle, let me pick up on that. D do we do a lousy job in this country of teaching young people the importance of business and prosperity to our future? Well, the, the junior achievement strengths uh, vary across the country. In certain places, I think in Greater Toronto, they're pretty good. But I think we can do an awful lot better. And I was talking to somebody the other day, just educating, uh, m making the young people look at uh, how much does it cost to go to school? What is a, what a, how, how much do you pay to run a car? Things like that. I mean, these are practical things which I think we need to do more of. Certainly, I didn't get it at school. I mean, I, everything I've learned about business is after college. So in our last 20 seconds here, give me one issue you think our agenda camp participants ought to be talking about tomorrow. Well, how do you shape an economy in London that will be competitive in the United States? That's the key issue. That's and I don't mean body. tomorrow, I mean on Sunday. Okay, Joe Martin, Relentless Change is the name of the book. And as always, we're grateful for your participation here at TVO today. Thanks so Thank much. Thank you very much.